good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the June 15th meeting of the Montpelier Development Review Board. I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the DRB, and I'm going to go through a list and introduce the others here uh, who are on the DRB and supporting its work tonight. Um, please raise your hand when I say your name. We have with us uh, board members, RJ Adler, Okay. Roger Krantz can pipe up by phone. He is here by phone, I believe. That's right. Thank you, Roger. Welcome. Um, Rob Goodwin. Joe Kiernan. Michael Lazorchak is here by phone. Yep, present. Jean Leon. Hi, Jean. Kevin O'Connell is our vice chair. We will be, and, and Claire Rock is um, a DRB alternate. Hello, Claire, welcome. Um, we're supported by Meredith Crandall, who you all know and appreciate as I do. Um, Mike Miller, our Zoom moderator, planning director for the city. And then Tammy Furry, Furry is the recording secretary for the DRB. Thank you, Tammy. All right, so I'll, I'll turn it over now to Meredith, who will describe um, the mechanics of our online process for those, particularly for those who may be watching on ORCA. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so this is um, a lot for public who might be out there and watching via ORCA um, and not actually on the meeting, and especially for, and also for those who are on a remote DRB meeting for the first time. Um, so, due to the state of emergency declared by Governor Scott as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to Addendum 6 to Executive Order 0120 and Act 92, the Development Review Board is authorized to meet electronically. Um, in accordance with Act 92, there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the temporary amendments to the Open Meeting Law, the Development Review Board is providing public access to this meeting by hosting a video conference meeting, including both video and telephone access options via the Zoom platform. Um, all members of the Development Review Board have the ability to communicate at the same time during this meeting through this platform, and the public has access to listen and, if desired, participate in this meeting in real time. So if you're home and watching via ORCA and you decide that you want to participate, you can either use this link, you can just plug it right into your browser and access the Zoom meeting, or you can also call in at this phone number, 929-205-6099, um, and use the meeting ID password that's listed here, and um, I'm sorry, meeting ID, and then the password. Um, we did give notice to the public previously on this access information um, via posting of the agenda. Instructions are also on the city's website um, at the pending applications for public hearings page that you can find through the agendas and meetings page or through the Department of Planning and Community Development. If anybody has a problem accessing the meeting, please email the meeting moderator, Mike Miller, at mmillermontpelier-vt.org. Further, um, if anyone is on the meeting in the Zoom platform and you're having problems, or you have a question as how to do something, you may message Mike through the chat function in Zoom. I'm gonna leave this information up um, as I discussed the last few bits about participating in the meeting. So once you're logged in, um, you should have an opportunity to tell the moderator which applications you wish to comment on. I think I know everybody who's on right now. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody new has come in. Um, and, so when the chair announces that the time for public comment on a particular application arrives, the moderator will unmute members of the public based on the order that you submit your intent to speak. Um, and then if you're interested in speaking and you didn't say that you would like to speak previously, you can raise your hand if you're in the video version of Zoom, or you can unmute yourself and state your name and city staff will add you to the queue of those ready to talk. Um, the, once the chair has recognized you to participate at a particular time, the moderator will unmute your microphone to confirm that you can be heard, or you can unmute it yourself. That seems to be the way things are working a lot lately. Um, and then you're free to provide your questions or comments. Please aim to keep them to two minutes um, at the initial comment period. Members will have the opportunity to respond or ask questions of you, and the applicant may also have an opportunity to respond. 
Um, the chair might grant, may grant additional time for speakers to have follow-up questions or comments. After you finish speaking, either micro mute your microphone yourself or it will be muted for you. Um, this helps prevent feedback and background noise that disturbs the meeting. The chair will then move on to the next person. Um, if in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be continued to a time and place certain. And please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by a roll call vote. I'm gonna hand it back over to Kate. Thanks, Meredith. All right, speaking of votes taken by roll call, our, the next item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? Motion by RJ, second? Second. Second by Kevin. Um, I'm going to go through your name and say yay or nay. RJ. Yes, uh, Roger. Yes. Rob. Yes. Joe. Yes. Michael. Yes. Jean. Yes. Kevin? Yep. Claire? Yes. And I also vote yes. We have an agenda. Thank you very much. Claire, could um, I just next item on Could I just make one small clerical point just for your own records? On sure. your your number eight on your review of the minute meetings, I think you mean May eighteenth, twenty twenty. It says this is February. Um, it actually is February. Those got yes. missed in getting approved previously. We okay. had a big long gap. So okay. those are actually February 18th minutes. Okay. I, did, I did miss a zero in 2020. Okay. Those are February. Okay. I thought that was referring to our meeting. So I'm oh, sorry. Those got approved at the last meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, comments for the chair. Well, the first thing I'd like to note is that this will be RJ's last meeting with us, I believe. Um, RJ, you've been great for the brief time that we've had you with us, and we congratulate you on uh, moving on to the next to the next step. Um, thanks for jumping right in while living in Montpelier and, and supporting this board and its work. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, folks. I'm I'm uh, about to purchase a house in Berlin, so uh, didn't know that was going to happen, or else I wouldn't have uh, put everyone through having a short-term member on the board. Uh, but I learned a lot and I had a lot of fun and I'm sorry to leave. Thanks, RJ. And good to meet you, at least you. on video. Exactly. Maybe someday we'll meet in person. All right, so um, also under comments for the chair, I'd just like to make a few remarks as, as we get underway. Um, I, I wanna first thank everybody for uh, who's been taking time, a lot of time, and to invest in their project and invest in these meetings. And I use the word investment very intentionally because I know projects are a lot of real work and so are these meetings. I also know that everybody's really dealing with quite a lot right now. We all have a lot going on in different dimensions of our lives and we're all doing our best. Um, and as we get underway tonight, I just wanna remind people again that this is a quasi-judicial process, it's not a courtroom. Um, and furthermore, it's a process that's overseen by volunteers who are doing their best to strike a balance between the needs and desires of people investing in our community, which we, of course, appreciate and need, and the rights and interests of abutters, and at the end of the day, the requirements of our zoning bylaw, which is the, the filter, the, the guide that we ultimately use to make sure that we can strike this balance. So as we get underway, I'm going to ask people to bear with us as we work to do our jobs, our volunteer jobs. And please do be patient if we err on the side of process in order to avoid excluding anyone. Um, I do appreciate your help and courtesy as we all find our way in the times where we are. So thank you. So the next item on our agenda is the continuation of 105 State Street. And with that, um, it is continued here and it's here before us with a new site design and circulation proposal in response to our comments at the end of the last meeting on June 1st. So I will note that the building remains largely the same. Um, so Meredith, could you please review the status of the application and identify some of the main changes, to the application and the main outstanding questions? Yep. Um, so, this is, I'm gonna, some of this is gonna be repeat for those of you who've been here, but I wanna make sure that anybody who's viewing via ORCA is aware of what's going on and a little bit of background. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. 
Um, so 105 State Street, you know, applicant is seeking major site plan approval for a new three-story building with, a, with commercial uses, um, including conditional use of a drive-up bank teller and ATM at the rear of the building and a new curb cut for vehicles um, that deals with Governor Davis. And this new design, this is now a um, where vehicles enter the drive-through for the um, ATM and bank teller. So the subject parcel is located in the Urban Center 1 Zoning District, as well as the Design Control District. For anybody looking from home, this is important because there are multiple specif specific things for Urban Center 1, like the fact that setbacks are at zero feet. They can build right up to the property line. Um, and because this went through design review, the Development Review Board doesn't have to look at the separate site plan design standards. So uh, the public hearing on this application opened on May 18th, was then continued to June 1st, and is continuing again this evening. Um, at the end of the June 1st meeting, after a deliberative session, the board indicated that it couldn't approve the original application as presented due to a failure to comply with section 3010 vehicle access and circulation requirements, specifically the requirement for adequate access and circulation to prevent traffic congestion on the street and traffic conflicts including service vehicles, passenger vehicles, parking, drive through lanes, bicyclists and pedestrians within the site, quote. This is section 3010, subsection B. Um, for the board of particular concern and potential vehicle and pedestrian conflicts between vehicles leaving the previously proposed ADA parking space and pedestrians on the sidewalk along State Street and also internal vehicle circulation issues given um, possibilities for parked vehicles on that original site plan needing to turn around in the adjacent right of way. Um, and so applicant redesigned their proposal to address these issues as seen starting on page 138 of the meeting packet. Um, this first page is a June 12th email from engineer Brian Lane Karnas. Following that is the actual redesigned site plan. So uh, that shows on page 141. So staff and personnel from the Department of Public Works, Tom McArdle and Corey Line, have reviewed the redesign. Comments from them and the city's planning director can be viewed on further pages within that meeting packet. We'll pull these up on the um, share screen as needed. Um, really, the, there's two major issues remaining that I have spotted from this redesign. The original, whether this redesign complies with the section 3010 issues that the board raised previously. Um, and then also whether the redesigned drive-through, which has an ATM kiosk versus being an ATM flush inside the building, um, meets the special use standards of section 3115 and the conditional use standards. Um, Kate, I don't know if, you know, there's, there's stuff in the staff report and other, you know, a, potential staff suggestions um, that are in there, but I think this might be a good place to stop. That's okay with you? Mm -hmm. It is, it is. I think our focus tonight is going to be on the things that have changed substantially and we will not spend um, much time on those that have not because those have been pretty thoroughly vetted in our previous um, conversations. So um, thanks Meredith, is there anything else you wanted to add before we move on? Um, I think, so there's one little side comment that I did get from um, the Tom McArdle from the Department of Public Works that came in late this afternoon. Um, that's something that Brian Lane Karnas may need to address, um, but it's, it's kind of minor. Should I throw it out now or wait till we're getting into the specifics of the redesign? Let's throw it out now so that when the applicant um, provide, presents the new site plan, that can be integrated or answered if, if appropriate. Perfect. So Tom said, quote, it would be advisable for the applicant to meet the pedestrian access route, so this is PAR, standard from the U.S. Access Board for the public right-of-way when it comes to the redesigned sidewalk adjacent to the ADA access space. Um, so it's advisable. It's not something that has to happen under the zoning regulations, but that PAR standard is for that to be a four foot width sidewalk. And I believe that on the redesigned, it's actually 3.75 feet. But again, that's to be advisable. Okay, so we can hear more about that and the choice to go with 3.75. Um, great. 
So here, here's how I'm planning to proceed through this um, with, with the option to remain a little bit flexible. We'll start by hearing the new present the presentation of the new site design from the applicant. I hope that can take about 15 minutes or so. Um, then DRB members will have an opportunity to ask questions about it. Um, then we'll hear from any interested parties who are present and wishing to speak, um, no more than eight minutes each. And DRB members will then have an opportunity to ask those folks any questions they may have. And um, from there, I expect that we will likely go into the staff report, but we will see if additional questions need to be need to be raised. Um, please address uh, all your questions through the chair if you if you wish to ask any. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Lozon and his team. I'm sorry, I have something I have to say before the applicant oh, starts. Yes, I, I'm um, sorry about that. Please go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so since the last uh, DRB meeting, uh, I've entered into a personal business uh, relationship with some of the individuals that are before the board today. As a result, I'll be recusing myself from the remainder of the DRB's business involving the 105 State Street redevelopment, uh, including any deliberative sessions that may happen. Um, I will be returning for the 206 River Street project hearing. Great. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that, that statement. And Meredith has one more thing to add as well. Um, just because of the, the shuffle with um, Joe stepping out. Um, so that we actually have eight other DRB members here, only seven of which can actually vote at a time. So I don't know if Roger is recusing himself because he wasn't at the first two wasn't able to participate in the first two full hearings, um, or whether he or Claire, whether either of them reviewed the prior hearing um, minutes or recordings, because I just want to make sure we know who's actually voting on this application. I, this is Roger. I didn't participate in the uh, previous meetings. I have reviewed some of the uh, material, but not all of it because I wasn't planning on participating in this application tonight, or voting on it. Okay, thanks Roger, that's fine. And Claire, did you prepare and intend to participate in the review and voting of this application or are you here, will you be participating in the next application? I have reviewed the materials, I've read the minutes from the May 18th and June 1st uh, meeting and was prepared to participate and be a voting member on this application. Very good. Okay, thank you, Claire, then. Okay. And now can we turn to the Mr. Lozon? Thank you. Um, may I ask the nature of the conflict? Is it a business relationship within a butter that the DRB member has? Um, I'm going to see if Joe's on any longer mm -hmm. before I speak for oh. him. Um, he he is not on, but oh. he has disclosed that he will be engaging the services of um, some of the people from the applicant's team. Oh, Your team. Um, oh okay. Because um, I was just going to say I didn't yeah. have an issue with it, but, um, okay. but no, he, he's going to do what, what he needs to do. Uh, well, yeah. uh, thanks very much. Uh, as Meredith said, the board uh, at the last meeting, the board uh, indicated uh, that they had uh, two issues with the site plan. Um, through this redesign, I think we've uh, addressed uh, both of those issues. Um, it's a new site pl plan, but it doesn't look very different if uh, you flip it. And, and that's essentially all we've done. And what that did is uh, blend the traffic to meet the uh, flow of traffic with 99 state. Uh, so rather than tell you what, you've got a long evening, rather than go on and on, I'm just going to turn it over to Brian, let him get into the specifics as quickly as possible. Great. Thanks, Tom. And uh, I apologize for the lighting on my video sitting in front of a west facing window right now at sunset. So <laughs> could be a little blown out. Um, so let me bring up the new site plan on the screen. So uh, as Tom was saying, uh, the essential redesign of the site is that we have uh, uh, mirrored the orientation of the building and the parking pre, uh, in relation to what was previously proposed. So um, instead of the parking being off of the shared right of way with 99 and 107 State Street, uh, the parking is now accessed off of Governor Davis Avenue 
Um, so same three parking spots, two um, regular parking spots and one accessible parking spot. Um, due to the mirroring of the, the location of the accessible space and the accessible access aisle have been uh, reversed north to south. Um, that's because if you only have one ADA space on your site, it has to be a van accessible space. If it's a van accessible space, the aisle has to be on the passenger side. Um, that was also actually beneficial for the project because it moved this space further away from both the crosswalk uh, and the intersection with State Street. Um, so that uh, resolved any uh, issues with the conflicts from a car backing out of this, um, either from cars on State Street or uh, folks in the crosswalk. And I could talk about that more specifically later. Um, the other kind of major result of the uh, mirroring of the site plan is that now, uh, as Tom mentioned, the drive through lane uh, goes the other way. So the entrance to the drive through is off of Governor Davis Avenue. And the exit is through the shared right of way. Um, therefore, the cars coming out of the drive through are, are going in the same direction as the one-way traffic that comes around um, 99 State Street. Um, although, obviously, this could be a two-directional two access uh, because it's the only access back to 107. Uh, State Street. Um, because the cars are now going through the other direction through the drive through, we had to move the ATM window uh, into a kiosk on the north side of the site because um, otherwise it would have been on the passenger side of the cars, which just doesn't work. Um, uh, Meredith mentioned uh, continuing to meet the standards of the um, specific standards for drive through uses. So we are maintaining the canopy, um, obviously, moved down to the you know, flipped over with the building. So there'll still be a canopy over the, um, the same canopy we had before over the drive-through service space. Um, the other question regarding the specific drive-through standards was whether this um, relocation of the, um, you know, the, the video screen or whatever it's going to be and the pneumatic tube to the, to the other side against the property line, um, you know, increased impacts for light and noise from neighboring properties. Um, and in fact, it, it'll reduce impacts from light and noise from neighboring properties, because now uh, if there is a video screen, the light from the video screen will be pointed south towards the building, um, as well as the speaker uh, that's used for communication pointed away um, from the neighboring property. Um, and so those two things are an improvement and, and otherwise the impacts from light and noise are um, similar to the ones that we had addressed in our, our original application. Um, just to run quickly through the other things that had to change to make this work, the building is uh, three feet smaller in width than it used to be um, in order to accommodate the turning movement of cars um, out of the drive through and into the common right of way. Um, and then we moved the end of the stairs and the landscape planter uh, all the way up to the edge of the right of way in the front, again, to accommodate this turning movement back here. Um, so let's just take a quick look. Um, oops, that's not what I want. Sorry. This one. So this is the movement of a car as it goes through the, uh, the drive through lane. Um, and I, I just wanted to bring up, because I mentioned briefly in the previous hearings that this, um, this is the passenger car design vehicle from the um, State Association of Highway Officials. And I did say that it was large, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands how large this vehicle is when they're looking at this diagram. So this design vehicle is um, seven feet wide and 19 feet long with an 11 foot wheelbase. That's bigger than a Chevy Suburban, and it's bigger than a Toyota Tacoma. Um, so if this thing is, is getting through here uh, without problems, then there's very, any vehicle that can't make this turn is a box truck and shouldn't be going through the ATM anyway. Um, but we just wanted to show that the vehicle can um, access the um, drive-through from Governor Davis Avenue and come out of the drive-through without encroaching outside of the um, 10 and a half foot right of way uh, on the exit. Um, I also, and I don't think that anyone has seen this yet, but I also prepared what it would look like for the vehicle backing out of the, the uh, accessible. Ryan? Yeah. I don't think the screen is, at least it's not changing for me. I don't know if it's changing for you. Is it supposed to be changing? What we're looking um, at? I'm not seeing anything are you, different on your screen. You're not seeing the vehicle turning movement? Is no, I'm seeing some color? flashes. 
Hold on a second. Let's see if I can bring it up. It's this one. Are you guys seeing it now? Yes. Okay. Those, the, the, you can see the routes. Right, so you can see the, here the car on Governor Davis Avenue and then proceeding through the drive through So you can see here that this, this you know, Chevy Suburban Toyota Tacoma can make this turn out of the, the drive through space without encroaching onto the, um, off of the 10 foot share right of way. Um, and this is, this line here is the front corner of the bumper and the next line is where the tires go. Um, so the other thing I want to share regarding turning movements, um, which would be this one. So can everyone see now we've switched to showing the movement of the car coming out of the accessible space? Okay. So uh, again, uh, this, this car now um, easily can back out of this space and turn around and leave before it hits the crosswalk. So these two lines of the crosswalk here, um, and so the car can come back and I don't have it turning until it's um, well outside the space. And I would just point out that the back of the adjacent space to the north is here. And in this movement, the car doesn't start turning until back here. So it's, it's easily able to back out and leave the space onto Governor Davis Avenue without going onto the crosswalk, um, you know, generously. Um, I also would like to just point out, because this was um, something that we discussed with Tom McCardle, is that when this car is at its rear, you know, its southerly most point backing out, there is space for a person who's coming down State Street and making a right turn. If they don't see this car backing out, there's enough space with the crosswalk and then the space for the um, cars that are parked in the par parallel parking spaces for another car to wait here and not block the traffic um, coming up and down State Street. So um, it's a significant improvement to both the potential conflicts uh, with pedestrians and um, eliminates the conflicts with traffic on the site that we've been discussing and doesn't create new conflicts um, along State Street. Um, and then just really briefly, I don't know that this is really relevant for zoning, but we did, because we flipped these two, the, the curb ramp here is now um, lowered all along here rather than being in a bump out, because um, there just wouldn't have been room to get the ramp down and have a bump out next to this car. Oh, I should briefly address uh, Tom McCardle's comment on the um, pedestrian access way with, so the, there's, there's two versions of the federal uh, accessibility standards. Um, one version is for um, uh, public buildings and private developments. And the other version is for ADA accessibility within public rights of way. So the, the four foot minimum width that Tom is referencing is for accessible facilities within a right of way. And that standard doesn't apply to this sidewalk, um, which is on a, on a private development and, and intended to provide access from these parking spaces, which are devoted to this development and getting uh, folks who need to get there accessibly into the door where the elevator is. Um, so the minimum, width of an accessible way under the, the ADA standards that apply to private developments is three feet. Um, and we exceed that with the 3.75 feet minimum width here. Um, we also modified this design at, at Tom's request. Um, you know, we had had this cutting in this corner a little bit here and we straightened out this sidewalk. So, you know, while there is this uh, point at 3.75 feet here, it's, it's right at the bottom of the ramp. By the time you get up to the top of the ramp, you're well over four feet here anyway. So, um, you know, we our contention is that we're meeting the relevant ADA design standards uh, with the width of the sidewalk there. Um, and so, with that, I'd I'd open it up to the any questions from the board members. Thank you very much, Brian. Really appreciate that overview. Um, board members, uh, please ask your questions if you have them. I can see everybody now, so if you'd please just raise your hand or if you're on the phone, you can just pipe up. Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so on the um, opposite side of the building, um, 10 foot right away side, there's a sidewalk there. Is that intended to be a, 
pedestrian access to the building in the rear, or, or is that just for 105 State? So similarly, it's the same as it was before. The sidewalk there is intended to access the egress door that's at the back of the building. Um, there's been no discussion or, um, you know, intention of having that sidewalk be a connector to the property behind. Um, Claire, I mean, I you had your I hand up. Just oh, I'm sorry, go that. ahead, Brian. I mean, we, yes. we certainly wouldn't have any objection if they, yes. we wouldn't object to, to folks walking down the sidewalk and accessing uh, 107 State Street, but it it could be a little problematic because there's no there's no pedestrian lane in the parking area at 107. So it would be likely that a pedestrian would use our sidewalk on the other side of the building. It would be a little safer for them. Yeah, and I was just I was just meaning to say that. Um, it's not our intention to provide access there, so we haven't provided a crosswalk across the um, the drive-through lane, or there's no there's nothing on the other side of it for for folks to land on on the 107 State Street property. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, um, Claire, and then RJ. Claire, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank go right you. ahead. Um, uh, could you clarify the location of the recycling door? I believe that was located on the Governor Davis side on the previous plan. Is that also being switched? And so those that type of um, recycling would then be serviced from the kind of the alleyway or the right of way side? So it used to be, it actually that enclosure used to be on the right of way side and now it's on the Governor Davis side. But really the intention is that what's gonna be stored in here for trash is toters. So um, they're probably gonna be taken out and pulled up onto the sidewalk to be picked up, um, you know, early in the morning, which is when I'm sure when that happens uh, in downtown. So there's no um, intention for like a garbage truck to be backing up to these doors or anything because the, the garbage will come out and move down to the curb line. Okay, thanks. Uh, RJ. So uh, just uh, going back to Rob's question about the uh, the sidewalk on the west, or sorry, on the east side of the building, near that door, um, just to make it more accessible, uh, can that curb there be cut into the ground so somebody with a wheelchair feels more safe if they do choose to walk or, or, or roll along that side, or is that like open up too many cans of worms? So um, we can't put a ramp there because we have the egress door there and we need a flat landing for the egress door. Um, but again, that's the same, it's the same situation as it, it's exactly the same as it was before when it was over here, um, you know, and, and there's, you know. Is there? If any uh, pedestrians want to access back here, they have to walk up the right of way, so. Is, uh, uh, is the curb cut uh, on the, on the, northwest side of the building um, for access. You talked about the ramp over on the, uh, you talked about the ramp where it was 3.75 feet here, but is there a curb cut over here so people could walk, walk that way? Up uh, here? Yeah, yeah. No, again, it's not our, our intention to provide a curb cut and um, you know, there's really, if you go, if you go across here, you're really crossing into where the cars are parked. Oh, so okay. If you right. went across here, you would, there would be no aisle or anything for you if you were in a wheelchair to go between the cars that are parked. So we don't want to funnel people in that direction anyway. No. Fair enough. Okay, thanks. Other questions from board members? Roger or Michael joining us by phone and having a hard time raising their hands. Would you like to add any, ask any questions? Uh, this is Michael, I'm good, thank you. Right, and, and Roger is, is just observing, I'm remembering. I'm just observing, Kate, yes. Thank you, thank you, okay. So if there are no more questions for all the board members on the revised proposal, um, what I'd like to do next is um, offer a chance for 
interest any interested other interested parties to present um, questions or new evidence, things that we have not heard in the last two hearings, based on the changed items in this in this proposal. We're, we're looking mostly we're looking primarily at that which has changed between the last hearing and this one. I would invite invite comments from interested parties. Ms. John Russell, I'd like to make some uh, some comments here. Please go right ahead. Um, I, I'm sort of um, uh, curious as to how this is all happening uh, this afternoon without allowing any, um, either basically not allowing the public to see uh, the change in the building. I didn't get the new uh, pictures of the building until the weekend. Um, and now we're seeing uh, changes to parking, et cetera, et cetera, um, here on uh, on Monday night, basically. So I don't know how that I don't know how that works uh, um, in terms of uh, governance. Um, but that be Perhaps that, I could. be that as it may, that's a, a comment. I don't need a reply. Um, um, you guys can figure that out for yourself and maybe the courts will figure it out later. Um, so one of my concerns is the, the narrowing of the aisle from uh, State Street back to 105 and, uh, and 99, uh, even though 99 is not here. Um, if there's nowhere for the, uh, basically there's nowhere for anybody to dodge, um, can't sort of hide behind the cars the way it was uh, last uh, two weeks ago um, for people that are, are walking up that basically 11 foot now, uh, a little over 11 foot width. Um, that does seem, seem a little, little dangerous there. Um, another comment is that uh, we have, we'll have uh, cars queuing up out on, uh, on Aiken, waiting to turn right to, uh, to go in and uh, cash their check or what have you. Uh, that doesn't look very safe at all. Um, and they'll be queuing up behind people trying to uh, unpark from these uh, new parking spaces. Um, and the new parking spaces are driving over or backing out over a sidewalk that people will be using, and it's already been mentioned, that uh, probably people will be using that sidewalk to get to 107, um, maybe because it's so narrow out on the other side. Um, and uh, so that's, that's uh, part of it. Um, also, the, uh, the van uh, that's uh, carrying somebody in who, uh, who requires a, a disabled van is backing out into blind traffic. Nobody is going to be noticing as they're turning right onto Aiken that somebody is trying to back out simultaneously. There isn't any policeman saying, you, you can come out, will you please stop, don't make the turn yet, et cetera. Um, that's, that's just too close, no matter what uh, you may think. Maybe the people that are thinking that don't drive, that's a, that's a possibility. Um, especially in, in Montpelier. Um, what about the totes? Uh, we're talking about um, garbage and totes and things like that out on the, uh, out on the public um, um, sidewalk. Apparently, uh, you know, Casella and Myers come by with an automatic truck that picks up the totes. They need to be able to get close to the uh, curb there, but there's a parking space there, um, has been, and uh, there's only one, but there is a parking space there. So Meyer, neither Myers nor uh, uh, Casella would be able to pick up the totes from there if, he, if there's a car parked there legally. Um, so that's just sort of the beginning. It just doesn't seem that this is really um, a building that's designed for the close, um, circumstances that are here in this part of, of, uh, of Montpelier. It's a major place for uh, vacationers to come uh, when they're not uh, 
of walking around behind masks. So there's oftentimes people that are completely unfamiliar with the, uh, with the area. There's also a lot of, uh, of um, I don't know if I'm running out of my eight minutes, but there's also a tremendous number of state employees that walk down that side of the street and uh, go um, you know, on into, and into the city center. So it just, it just doesn't seem like this is a good idea for um, a, a building of this nature. I don't see any problem with the building. The building's a building. He has, Tom's got problems with, uh, <laughs> with flood, which I think is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with the, the flood uh, problem and uh, Tom's done what he can to, uh, to ameliorate that for uh, for his potential tenants, but this doesn't look like a um, a place that uh, this building can go. This this style of type of um, um, vehicle access building doesn't look good. Wow. All right, thank you, Mr. Russell. Um, what we'll do is hear from any others who wish to speak on this, um, and then we'll turn it back over to the applicant. Um, and if anyone else wishes to speak, I just remind you, um, please focus on the things that are new about the project. And um, as, as was referenced, we're, we're looking at about an eight minute, eight minute window. So is there anyone else um, wishing to speak about the redesign who is not the applicant? Apparently uh, somebody here. Well, Alicia's here and, and Patrick Mullen are both here, so. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the sidewalk on Governor Davis is on the opposite side of the building, correct? Brian? That is my understanding. And if there's nothing else from um, from people who wish to speak about the project, maybe what I could do now is turn it back to um, back to Tom and Brian to address any of the questions. I'm particularly interested in um, your response on on things that are, are that we're reviewing tonight. The narrowing of the, the the question regarding the narrowing of the aisle back to 107. Um, the new parking space and whether it conflicts with a sidewalk, as was just asked, and um, how the if you could explain, uh, we, we we've heard how the backing out of the ADA space works with leaving a visual if you're turning right off of State Street. So I don't think you need to um, speak to that again. But Brian, if you or Tom, if you'd like to speak to those other things. Sure. Um, Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Or Tom, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Russell made a couple comments about cars backing over sidewalks. There's there's no car that backs over a sidewalk anywhere with this new proposal. Um, so I'll just um, go over that quickly one more time. Um, well, that wasn't quite the one I wanted, but it'll work. Um, again, we show that the note, this car doesn't back over the sidewalk or the crosswalk here. There's, um, you know, and this sidewalk is inside of the spaces. So um, in terms of narrowing the lane uh, over here, um, I just point out again that the only legal access to 107 State Street is this 10 and a half foot width right of way. Um, and we're leaving a little bit more than that and certainly um, matching what exists there now with the, um, Jersey barriers that are placed along the edge of the existing parking area. Um, so there's no change to the width of the right of way uh, compared to how it stands at the moment. Um, there was a, a comment about uh, the stacking and uh, potential conflicts with uh, Governor Davis Avenue. Um, so there's, there's no change to what we presented about why the, the one service space and two stacking spaces are adequate for this use. Um, there's probably functionally another spot that someone could sit here if it was became really necessary at, at high peak times. And unlike the previous design, if the drive through is full, someone can continue on Governor Davis Avenue and circle around the block and come back, um, which wasn't really possible with the previous design. So um, we presented evidence that the amount of stacking spaces is adequate and um, also improved the ability for uh, folks to make a different decision if need be um, with the drive through. Um, I think, I think that's what you're looking for. Kate, remind me if there's one I missed. Okay, great. Oh, the garbage. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the garbage, I, I, you know, it's no different than any other, 
um, business in the downtown that only has access to the front of the sidewalk. So it's whatever needs to be done to manage the garbage at this um, site is, is, is no different than any, any other downtown site on State Street west of here. I'm sorry, east of here, that way. I must admit, I've never Great. seen a tote. You've never seen a tote? They're green, sometimes they're blue. I've seen no, black uh, ones. Okay, sar too. sarcasm works. That too. sounds like it. That would. I was just describing a tote, Mr. Russell. Yeah, not, but I think anybody, that, um, okay. I, I, as one DRB member, I think I've received sufficient evidence on totes. Um, are other DRB members, um, do any other DRB members have any questions uh, with regards to anything we just discussed or, um, or other aspects of this application uh, about which you have remaining questions? Yes, Claire. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, I think Meredith identified um, some points um, that she had on this application that may not have been included in the uh, recent email communication. And I was wondering if she could just um, uh, remind me of those again. So oh, the, the stuff that wasn't circulated previously? Is that what you're talking about? I thought at the beginning when you were introducing the most recent um, submittals that um, there were some items that you, um, some comments that you had that may not have been included in the, the email that you circulated. Yeah, so that was just the, the, the sidewalk width, the 3.75 versus four feet. Everything else has been circulated. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, the last thing I'd like to do before we deliberate as a board is I would like to look at the um, special use and conditional use standards so that as Meredith suggested, we can assure that the drive-through redesign continues to meet those standards. So in our staff report, um, be beginning on page, sorry, I'm finding the right page. The conditional use standards begin on page 21. Um, and to pertain just to the drive-through facility, not the whole project. Um, staff find that it will not burden community facilities and utilities. Um, we've just discussed how um, traffic will or will not be impacted and staff recommendation is that it meets those requirements. Uh, similarly, neighborhood standards, character of the neighborhood standards, architectural compatibility, um, yard lot coverage, landscaping, all of these according to staff are met um, to the satisfaction of the of the standards. Uh, do board members have any questions about any any new questions about conditional use uh, with this redesign? Yeah. Okay. Rob, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know. I guess I'd like to see the applicant um, maybe elaborate on the, uh, you know, facility sufficient distance from the property line. Um, you know, this um, kiosk is going to be the closest bank drive through to any property line in Montpelier, um, just in my cursory review. Um, it seems like a big, big part of this. And so I just didn't know if you could elaborate on your um, sort of counter to that this, this meets that standard. Oh, my mute. No. Uh, well, we believe it does. Um, Brian, would you like to elaborate on that? We had a discussion about it. Uh, you know, this is zero setback. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, so when you talk about, uh, you know, the standards for a drive through, I don't believe the standards contemplate uh, whether, you know, a, a counterclockwise traffic movement, which would mean uh, when these this ordinance was written, you would have to allow within the standards for the possibility of clockwise traffic movement, which would necessitate, and especially in this district where there's zero setback requirements, uh, would necessitate placing it uh, close to the property line. 
And I would add that the uh, the standard that we need to meet here is that the uh, facility is a sufficient distance from the property line to um, mitigate impacts to neighboring properties. So um, as we presented in our original application, uh, we don't expect that light or noise from this particular drive through window is going to really um, exceed what's happening in the background of downtown Montpelier um, with traffic noise on the street and parking and, and general noise around there. And additionally, uh, any, you know, while it's closer to the property line, um, the, the additional, um, well, there's not additional noise, but the, the source of noise being placed closer to the property line is mitigated by the fact that the direction of the sound from the um, from the kiosk is now turned around and facing into the site rather than before when it was, you know, 12 feet from the property line, but it was facing the adjacent property owner. So um, due, due to the mitigating factor of the uh, kiosk facing the other direction uh, into the property instead of away from it, we believe that there is no, that uh, there's no setback that's necessary to avoid undue adverse impacts on the neighboring properties. All right, thank you. And Rob, thank you for that question. Really to the special use standards for drive-through, that was the main outstanding issue on which we um, needed to collect some evidence. All right, um, BRB members, are there any further questions before we um, enter into a deliberative session together? Okay, so I I propose, oh, um, yes, Ms. Just, just one, but if, if you're deliberating for, the, for, for our benefit, I know you have other things on your agenda. Um, I, I don't expect, I, I don't need an answer this evening. If, if it would make it easier for you to simply, we'll sign off, you can continue with your agenda, whatever you're comfortable doing. Just wanted to. Well, thank, thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. We were going to deliberate to, for the benefit of, of resolving it while you were present um i'm hearing that it's okay with you if, if we don't do that and you hear back another you hear back um, tomorrow kate um, weren't we also yes meredith sorry weren't we also going to do that so that rj would be able to participate since he has to he wouldn't be able to stay on until 10 o'clock or where that's however true. Late? that's true so you know we thank you meredith that's a good reminder we are going to um take a pause and if, if the board agrees, um, enter into a deliberative session mid, mid meeting here. Um, you don't need to remain for our answer. Um, no, if I we will. come back and you're not here, we, we won't be, we won't feel that we've been left at the dance. <laughs> um, I'll be um, here. But thank you, thank you for that option. Uh, yes, Kevin. Yes, Joe, so I'd just like to make a motion to uh, adjourn to deliberative session uh, for the application. Second. <clears throat> Motion by Kevin, second by RJ. I am going to conduct a roll call on that motion. Technically not adjourned to deliberative session, is it, Meredith? No, it's not adjourned to deliberative session. It's a short... Just well, to it close the public session. meeting and then uh, reconvene in deliberative session. Right, but we're going to come back to the rest of the public meeting. So we can't close the public meeting completely. It's sort of okay. a recess. The, I, I, agree, I agree to the amendment to my motion. <laughs> yeah, the motion is just to open a deliberative session. Okay, we have a motion to open a deliberative session and a second. I will um, take a vote on that motion. Um, RJ. Aye. Roger. Oh, Roger's not voting. Yes. I'm oh, sorry, Roger. But he said yes. Okay. Um, Rob. Yes. Joe. Oh, Joe's not on this one either. Um, you can tell I'm using a list. Um, Michael. Michael, who may be on mute. Uh, yes. Michael. Thanks for unmuting Thank me you. there. Jean. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Gene. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Claire. Yes. And I vote yes. Um, we will open a deliberative session in a separate Zoom call. Those who wish to remain on this Zoom call, it will remain open. We will be back as soon as we reasonably can. Thank you very much. I would entertain a motion regarding 105 State Street. RJ. 
Motion to approve the new three-story building and changes of use, including the drive-through conditional use as presented in application number Z2020-0027 and supporting the supplemental materials subject to the following conditions of approval. One, concrete materials on the building facades will be the color tinted to match the granite materials on the remainder of the facade as closely as possible. Two, applicant will ensure compliance with erosion control practices of 3008.D during the uh, construction activities. Three, within 30 days of this decision and prior to issuance of any permanent ap applicant shall submit to the zoning administrator professionally prepared lighting plan identifying the locations for all outdoor light fixtures with keys, uh, key to appropriate lumens issued by each type. Thank you for the motion. Uh, the, we have a motion from RJ. Is there a second? Um, un please unmute if you'd like to. Uh, motion from RJ. Second? The se I, I will make the second. Uh, I do have a procedural question, though. Uh, should, do we need to officially reopen the public hearing? It was never closed, was it? Was the never public closed? hearing wasn't closed, okay. so, um, good. so I believe not. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion from board members? Hearing none, I will call a roll vote. Um, Kevin? Yes. Claire? Yes. RJ? Yes. Michael? No. Jean? You're muted. Uh, Jean, you're muted. Yes. Uh, Jean? Yes. Rob? No. Thank you, Jean. Rob? No. Sorry, Rob? And no. I vote yes. Um, we have five yeses and two noes um, for the motion, and the project is approved. And I will turn it over to Meredith next to let us know, let, let you know um, what the next steps are. Um, so the next step is a written decision. Um, we're going to be, I'll work on that as quickly as I can. Technically, we have up to 45 days from the close of the hearing, which is now with the motion, um, it's going to be much sooner than 45 days, if at all humanly possible, much sooner. Um, but I'm human. So, uh, and then, so that will get issued. If you get me the lighting plan before that gets issued, then I can issue the decision at the same time that the permit is issued. Um, otherwise, the decision will go out. Then when I get the lighting plan that's required, I'll be able to issue the permit. Um, there is a 30-day appeal window after the written decision for people to appeal that written decision. Um, just note if there is a significant gap between the written decision and the permit getting issued because of needing to meet the conditions, there is an additional 15-day uh, appeal period after the permit. So those can overlap or they can be staggered out depending on um, how everything gets met with the conditions. If you have any questions, you can email me. That wasn't clear. Sorry, it was a lot of information. That concludes our discussion of 105 State Street. And I thank you all again sincerely uh, for your time and your work on this. And um, best of luck with your next step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. You too. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm heading out we... now, too. Thanks, folks. Thank you, RJ. Thank you, RJ. Appreciate your, your help and your service. See you around. Yeah, um, good luck. Joe, good welcome. luck, RJ. Yeah. Um, Joe, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. So um, we are going to start our review of 260 River Street. Um, there's no denying it's a bit late. It's nine o'clock. Um, I would like to dive in anyway because you've waited. 
I'm seeing some nodding from the engineer who's ready to go. Um, and so let's, let's without further ado, um, thank you very much for waiting. I'm looking forward to hearing about your project. This next application at 260 River Street is for major site plan and conditional use approval potentially at 260 River Street. So the first thing I would like to do is um, swear in anyone who will be speaking on this matter. So please unmute yourself and then I'll swear you in. Um, Raise your right hand, please, if you're going to give testimony. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yes. Great. Thank you. We have sworn in Lee Rosberg, John Rooney, Patrick Malone, and Alicia Thieler. Um, and Sarah Hoffmeyer. And Sarah Hoffmeyer. Sorry, Sarah. There it is. Okay. Thank you. So um, with that, Meredith, could you please provide us an overview of the project? Um, I will in one second. There's one other procedural item. We currently have eight ERB members in attendance, including two alternates. So okay. unless one of the DRB members has a, um, one of the standard members has a reason to recuse themselves, then, I mean, both of the alternates can stay and ask questions, but ultimately we have to figure out which seven are going to be voting. Okay. Um, are there any um, non-alternates who cannot vote? I just wanted to add, no, I, I can vote. I just wanted to add to Meredith's comments. We can uh, allow the, uh, all, uh, all the members, including the two alternates, to take part in the procedural process, including asking questions and, and so forth. Uh, and as far as the vote, um, it, 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 may, you know, it may or may not be tonight. It is already quite late. So my guess is that there's a good chance the uh, uh, public hearing would be uh, 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 carried forth to uh, another day, in which case it's a matter of who is here at that time. Uh, that would really matter as far as this issue is concerned. Good point, Kevin. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. Um, thanks. That's, that is how we'll proceed. Um, great. Meredith, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this relatively brief given the hour. Um, so first off, if you have the entire meeting packet in front of you, the staff report for this application actually begins at page 268 of the meeting packet. That's deep into the actual 260 River Street application. Um, so 260 River Street um, is an existing six plus acre parcel that can currently contains the former Grossman's Lumber Building, um, as well as a large amount of pavement that they used for on-site storage, outdoor storage of lumber and parking and delivery trucks. So there's a lot of impervious surface already. Um, applicant is seeking major site plan approval to construct a uh, roughly 7,800 um, square foot building addition on top of the existing, well not on top of, connecting to the adjacent 12,950 square foot building, along with associated revised drives, parking, utilities, landscaping, and grading, and to change the use of a parcel to office space and automobile repair and service with an accessory use of outdoor storage. Um, the, the first big question for the DRB is a preliminary determination of whether the um, sewer related facility use applies here. Um, because the proposed tenant for the parcel is a liquid waste hauler who will use the location as office and a repair maintenance building for their fleet of vehicles um, and storage of equipment related to the business. However, no waste is going to be actually treated on site. Um, sewer related facilities require conditional use approval. Um, I'm not going to go into the staff suggestions at this point when you want them, ask for them. If you didn't pull them out of the, the staff report. Um, so that's the first big question that's going to need to be dealt with. Other than that, there are some questions about development in the riparian buffer. If at any point anybody needs a reference to where in the, the staff report that is, I'll be able to tell you. Um, there's questions about uh, internal pedestrian access and a potential issue with, potential, with linking that to the public sidewalk, whether or not that's required. 
Um, the board's going to need to look over the design standards of section 3207 because this did not go through design review. It's a major site plan, an addition, um, and so that those design and compatibility issues are going to be reviewed. Um, there's a question about outdoor lighting and whether, um, this is minor, but whether the 20 foot tall freestanding lights along the internal walkway um, should be, are acceptable given a preference for 12 foot high fixtures for pedestrian oriented spaces. Um, there's also a request for um, a fence that's in the front yard to be more than four and a half feet tall because it's being used as screening. So the DRB is gonna have to make a determination on that. There were also issues highlighted in the staff report about a need for additional information to confirm compliance with the solar access and shading requirements. Um, there's a minor suggestion for a condition on approval with regard to the automobile, automobile repair or service um, special use. And then some, um, again, suggestions for conditions with regard to erosion control, stormwater, and steep slopes that are really about having the proper documentation in the files. Great. Thank you, Meredith. And the applicant has received a copy of the staff report before today in, in the Friday packet with the rest of us, I assume. Great. Okay. So um, next, what I'd like to do is turn it over to the applicant and, and give you the time that, time that you need. Maybe let's aim for about 15 minutes, a little more if you need it, um, to tell us about your project. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Alicia Seiler with Mullen Properties. Um, so I'm going to, sh I don't know if I have, may I share a screen? Is that allowed? Uh, sure. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Is it working? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so the property is along Route uh, 2, also River Street. It's at the intersection, the roundabout with 302. Um, and this entrance was constructed in 2009 as part of this roundabout project. Can you see my cursor as well or not? Great. Um, so the entrance would stay exactly as um, it has been before. It was designed this way as part of the roundabout to maintain access to this lot when this uh, previous entrance was closed as part of that construction. Um, so the site is entered here. It's two-way traffic um, everywhere. The employee parking is located kind of on this main drive and then also in this parking area. Here's our building addition. There is a portion over on the um, northern side or this left side that's a two-story portion. Um, and John can talk more about that um, when we get there. Uh, so these areas here on the very far north are proposed to be outdoor storage. And then this area in here is also outdoor storage um, with several, seven, um, overhead doors for maneuvering vehicles in and out to, so that maintenance work can all be happening inside the building. And then also some of those vehicles, um, in the company vehicles would be located out in these outer parking spaces. So these outer parking spaces are severely oversized in comparison to um, a typical eight and a half by 18. They're, um, I think I'm, they're 12 by 30 are shown here just to make sure that the site would actually accommodate them. Um, a couple of things. So we do have fencing over along here around these outdoor storage. And then there's also a split rail fence along the uh, riparian buffer as a, a way to minimize um, traffic foot traffic or access to to that area, um, both because that area is the repairing buffer as well as um, part of the um, soils remediation and, and whatnot. We wanna eliminate people from, from walking in that area. Um, there, I can, there's, there, is, there is lighting along here. One of the items that Meredith did mention, is this, these are the lights that she was referring to about being close to the sidewalk, which they are, they're up against the sidewalk, but they're also lighting this large um, outdoor storage and also maneuvering area. Um, and so to have lights not up against that um, would put them even further on the outside. It, it eliminates some of the lighting that would happen in that center portion. 
Um, there is a landscaping plan that I didn't show on that site plan just because I wanted to keep it minimal. Um, and I have other plans moved on there, but this, this is the proposed landscaping. Um, we really want to make sure we have that screen. So not just the fence around the outdoor storage, but just screen the whole kind of site from, from public view. Um, there are a couple of little areas of the stream bank um, in the riparian buffer that do have landscaping proposed. Those are our outfalls for our stormwater. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about those. Um, so those are the main landscaping areas. Also, there's also one right here in the front of the building. There's kind of a, a recessed area that we, we chose to make sure that we could fit a couple of trees, um, small size trees in there to really break up the front of the building. Um, this project does have a substantial amount of utilities being um, put into, into works, um, the biggest of which is the stormwater and then also the wastewater system previously was on site. Um, and we're connecting to the municipal sewer. Um, it, the building hasn't been used since um, in the 90s, so that wastewater system is, is no longer uh, functioning. Um, so then also, I think it's worth bringing up the grading plan right now, just to kind of give a very rough uh, talk about it. So as you come in off, the, the drives are mostly, um, everything drains internal to the parking areas and the drives. So there are catch basins collecting the water. Water isn't um, flowing off the site without going through um, the state regulated treatment um, that's required. Um, so these areas here to the far north and then also to the far south are areas that we are, um, and I don't know if you can see the elevations, they are, they are piles. Um, so those areas are in order to contain the soil that is disturbed from the site development. Um, those are areas that we're looking to locate the soil to. And this is um, the kind of worst case scenario. We are trying to accommodate and make sure to plan for the, the majority of the soil to be here. If we should run into less of um, kind of the contaminated soils or the soils of concerns, um, then we these might not be quite so um, quite the size. So um, I think that's a, a rough run through, but we can kind of get through um, individual items as we go. That's okay. Sure. That's okay. Great. Um, are there any, let's see, I think that with this one, what I, what I would recommend we do is um, have DRB members raise questions as we go through the staff report. Is that amenable to DRB members? Nodding. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And um, great. Thanks. So um, I'll ask next if there are any um, any other parties to be heard on this application other than the applicant, um, abutters or or other interested parties. Okay. Um, it looks like not. If, oh yes, yeah. Meredith. Meredith, at this point, yes, I'm supposed to turn it over to you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it doesn't look like there's any interested parties who are attending tonight, but I did get a last minute email from um, somebody and a butter that I'm going to need to read into the record because they couldn't attend and we couldn't get this out here. Um, and I can, I, I will post an actual copy of this on the city website. To, well, I'll try and get it posted tomorrow. I don't actually have the authority to post it, um, but we'll get it posted tomorrow somehow. Um, so this is from Mark. Saba, S-A-B-A, -A, um, who's president of Formula Ford Incorporated um, that is at one of the adjacent properties. I don't remember exactly which address right now. Um, so his email says um, that it was, uh, let me get to the pertinent part. Okay, so Formula Ford is glad to see a revitalization plan for the 260 River Street property. Our biggest concern is any air quality issues, foul smells, that could arise from the liquid waste being hauled and contained in the trucks while on the property that could adversely affect our business, employees, or customers. Formula Ford would like to be listed as an interested party as this project moves forward. Thank you for your time. And that's what I have. Thanks. Thank you, Meredith. So if there were someone here in person, um, I'd give the applicant a chance to respond to the comment raised by, by butters or others who are interested. And I'll give you that same chance now if you'd like to address that. 
Sure. Um, we are not concerned with smells associated with this development. The um, waste hauling occurs and the trucks are all emptied um, prior to coming back to the site. If the, uh, excuse me, they're emptied at the Montpelier um, wastewater treatment facility or any other contracted wastewater facility. Um, so there are a chance that trucks would be returning to the site after the facility has, wastewater facility has been closed for the evening, um, in which case those trucks would, would have sewage or um, other liquid waste on them. Um, we're not concerned with the smells that the trucks are enclosed and, and um, they're not open to um, emit odors uh, as the day goes on. Um, the, you know, if there's, if there's portalettes, those are cleaned on site before they're, they're transported back, um, excuse me, they're on the site where they're, they've been used and then they're, and then they return to the site in a, in a clean state. Um, so we're not concerned about the smells being an issue um, and, and certainly causing um, offense to, to neighboring properties. All right, thank you. Great, um, any questions from board members about the project in general before we go into the specifics? Yeah, Claire. Hi, thank you. Um, I uh, just had a question about the the current condition of the site, and um, I had um, been looking at the site from going along the new bike path, and had noticed like these big white, uh, what looked like um, straw bales or hay bales um, that were along the riverbank, and have noticed there's been some site work out there, and noticed like some of them were like ripped open at some point, and but then they look like there's been some earthwork there, and I was wondering if you could just kind of clarify the status of um, any of the earthwork activities that either have already happened at the site or um, which are currently happening at the site? Sure, and we, uh, Rossberg with Stone Environmental, maybe can help talk about that. There was a previous project for remediation, um, and that's, I think, what you're seeing out there. Lee, could you contribute? Yeah, sure. There is a partial corrective action plan um, that was approved by the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and we did a remedial action of removing uh, coal tar and coal tar contaminated sediment from the bank of the river in December. Um, that was done under um, Army Corps of Engineer and um, stream alteration permits. And that, that works complete. And uh, we're working towards uh, revegetating the river bank. And as far as I know, the um, site's been tidied up and the uh, the large bags that you've seen have been removed. But um, yeah, that, that work was associated with um, uh, dealing with an imminent risk of having coal tar directly in contact with surface water. That's good. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Kevin. Okay, so could you just uh, tell us what levels of review are required in addition to our review at the city level, uh, environmental permits, state permits, uh, so on? Sure, um, so this project will require a state of Vermont municipal um, water and wastewater permit. It will require a um, construction stormwater permit in 9020 um, and then an operational stormwater permit for this uh, site. Um, it, does, it does not trigger any um, Act 250 because we're, we're here with the DRB. Um, there is um, public safety type of fire um, and buildings, building safety permit that is required through that. Um, we aren't doing work in the stream um, so we don't need to do any additional stream alteration permits that those ones are kind of part of the um, previous projects in the Army Corps we're not we're not interfering or disturbing any of the wetland or wetland buffer so those aren't um, necessary for this project so it's it's stormwater uh, construction stormwater and then um, water wastewater permits 
Thank you. And building safety. Sir. Thank you, Kevin. Good question. Any last questions from DRB members on broad broad issues before we get into the specifics of the staff report? The nature okay. of the nature of the storage facilities uh, laid out in the designs. What is the what are you storing? What's the nature of the the storage units throughout the property? Yeah. Right over here. Yep, in these two areas. Um, I think the idea was to, to offer a space for um, like we port let the, the porta potty um, space, and so that's where we definitely wanted fencing around the sides. Um, but, any, but anything else that they, they equipment related to their services, um, generally speaking, their vehicles already have any extra hoses and such on them, um, but sometimes they, they do have. I think they would have hoses, um, extensions, and um, I, that's really that's really the main bulk of it. They have their, their the equipment vehicles, um, portalettes, and then um, probably some some minor tools like the the hoses. And then also inside the building is likely to have equipment storage as well. Um, and how many? Okay. So is it the company renting portalettes? And how many portalettes would be on the Property. Um, I, I so, we didn't um, just determine a number of of portalettes. Those are just the areas that we designated as potential storage for yeah. equipment they would okay. need. Okay, so it sounds like the portalettes that would be serviced at this site would be stored in the screened areas that we'll be discussing in a few minutes. Um, that's what the purpose of those storage areas are. So, Gene, the the size of those storage areas could be could be filled, but they, we are going to hear about how those are proposed to be screened and managed. Okay, well, let's, um, let's turn to the staff report. You heard um, from Meredith about the main issues that we have to look more closely at. So let's get right to it and start with the very first one. Um, on page five of the staff report, our first, the first thing we need to do is be sure about what use we're reviewing because the use we're reviewing says, uh, dictates what standards we apply to make sure the use is suitable. So the initial matter is to decide whether is this whether this is considered a sewer related facility use. And Meredith has given us the definition of that, which is it's a, it, it's defined as electric lines and distribution facilities, phone lines, cable lines, gas lines and distribution facilities, water supply lines steam and air conditioning lines, and sewer and stormwater lines, also including substations, pump stations, and other related unmanned systems. So um, we want to, the staff recommendation is that, you know, because this is a, haul, a hauling operation, because this is not about pumping waste from the site to elsewhere or from elsewhere to the site, um, that it really doesn't fall under this utility kind of transmission Concept. So that is the staff recommendation is to find that this is not a sewer related facility. Um, and I want to ask DRB members if you agree with that or have questions about it um, as we determine the use. I've got a thumbs up and I've got a question from Claire. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had a question. I, I think you were reading the definition of a utility facility. Ah, uh, was I? Okay. Yes. It's right above but on the So I was just clarifying it's number that, one, four one. Oh. Um thank you. Thank you. You're right. Okay. I read the wrong thing. <laughs> a sewer related facility is within the class of utilities, which I just defined, and is defined as facilities for storing, pumping, or treating sewage. That right. makes more sense. It, it may be that my so it's yeah, it's a sewer that definition is the sewer related facility, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, yeah, the one that I just read. So that's what we're deciding on. Do we believe that this is a facility for storing, pumping, or treating sewage? Well, we know it's not treating sewage. It's not a sewage treatment plant. Um, Alicia, do you want to jump in? Um, I just, I, I feel like I need to clarify that it does say and treating, not or. That's all. Thank you. So that it's matters. pumping and treating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are there any DRB members who feel strongly that this is a sewer related facility? I think no. It is. Okay. I do. I do. 
You do. Okay, so we have one board member who feels this is a sewer-related facility. The definition says that it has to, that it involves treating sewage, um, but it, that doesn't happen on the site the way it would at a wastewater treatment plant. And this also refers to as storing. Yes, um, storage is temporary when the trucks come in, it sounds like. And it, I think my sense, and based on what Alicia said, it, the facility has to do all three of those things. It has to store, pump, and treat the sewage to count. Okay. That's, is there anyone? Sorry, just from an interpretive standpoint, you really have to take the whole sentence as a whole. You can't just pick and choose. That's all I'm going to say on that. Okay. So are there other, um, besides Jean, are there board members who think this is, that this is a uh, sewer related facility? Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, I just like Meredith um, directing this toward to you. The last statement. Uh, can you read that sentence in which all three are contained? I'd like to hear the whole thing. Sure. So this is on page five of the staff report. Mm -hmm. A sewer-related facility is within the class of utilities, which is a defined term, uses, and is defined as facilities for, quote, facilities for storing, pumping, and treating sewage. Okay. The operative the term. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, the operative term seems to be and, so yes. treating the three as a as a unit. So I would agree. I would agree with the conclusion um, that you have reached on that. Okay, so we are not going to treat this as a sewer related facility, and that means that it will not be subject to conditional use approval. Go um, ahead and unmute Meredith if you want to ask something. I think you. I hate to say this. You might actually have to have a vote on that because it's a major determination. I mean, maybe you can roll that in at the end, but if you if you just have a vote on it now, it's dealt with and you don't have to go through that part of the staff review. I know that's what we've done previously. Okay. When it makes it when it matters for how you're going to review the the application. Okay. It wouldn't hurt. So that means we need to decide which seven of us are voting. So of the two alternates, Claire and Jean, um, yeah. Which, which of you would like to engage on this application? Um, you know, Jean, you've, you've served us well in the last three meetings. I don't know if Claire wants to step in and give you potentially a break next week. I don't know if that's, um, we don't usually do this in, in the public part of the hearing, sorry. Um, Understandable. I, I, wa I wanna just, uh, Meredith, I, I have to take exception to the statement you just made. I don't think it's quite a necessity for us to make a determination as to whether we're reviewing it singularly or uh, all three items at the same time. I think we've we've established a general a general outline for the review, and I don't feel we need to take it further at this point. We can take testimony um, and then finalize no. that. I can, yeah, Kevin. I, I don't think that I don't, I don't think that's being proposed. I think we're just putting our stamp on our decision that it's not a sewer related use. A sewer related facility. We're not analyzing it any further. And uh, um, I mean, it's getting late, so things are going to start yeah. getting a little fuzzy here. But uh, I yeah. just want to pursue that for a second. Um, so, what does that gain us that we've determined before uh, a final vote uh, that it's not a sewer related facility? I, I don't. That's a big I, question. I, so, determining what the use is. A, a sewer-related facility would be um, subject to conditional use review, whereas the other uses taking place on this site, including automotive repair, are not subject to conditional use review. Okay, so and so I did, it it lays it, it affects the part it affects the parts of the zoning bylaw that that will have to use to approve the project. I want to be uh, very clear again as we get later into the evening uh, that I am not comfortable voting on that is a singular issue. You know, maybe at the beginning at 7 p.m. Uh, of the next meeting, perhaps we could we could revisit that. But I think this is uh, this is a very highly uh, potentially technical area that uh, I'm, I'm just not comfortable voting on it right now. I agree with Kevin. Okay. I would like to proceed with this review as though it is not a sewer Right. Related. 
keep forgetting, a sewer related facility. Um, if we receive evidence that leads us to believe otherwise, that it is something that is for storing, pumping, and treating sewage, then I think we can continue to the very end of the staff report and do the conditional use review. Um, I'm in agreement with that. Okay. Um, I hear from Claire and others may have as well that um, if we continue to the July 6th hearing, she will not be present. Um, and so that that means that Jean will be one of our seven. Is that okay with you, Jean? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So given the hour and that we have um, we have the applicants, consultants and everything with us, I, I think I'd like to continue Sally forth, as, as was said earlier, into the remainder of the application. I'd like to hear more about the shrubbery. Um, well so stated. Now that we've, thank you, thank you. Um, very good. So we we um, let's start our review. So the first thing we're going to look at is the category of standards called general standards that apply to all development. And um, what I'm going to do is kind of move through the ones on which there seems to be agreement, um, or and invite board comment if kind of in batches. So here we go. Um, I'll give you page numbers as we go. On page six, we've got section 3002, dimensional standards, which um, staff find the requirements are met. The same is true for 3003 and 3004, accessory uses and structures and demolition. Staff finds that these um, requirements, the, the requirements for these sections are met. Um, do any DRB members have questions about dimensional standards, accessory uses and structures, or demolition? And my, my intent is to be expedient, not to be rushing anybody. So if you do have questions, do ask. Um, but if there's nothing to talk about, we won't belabor it. Okay. So I'm going to move on next to pay, um, section 3005, which is riparian areas. This is on page eight of the staff report. And um, what we what we have in the staff report is that um, what's being proposed is for about 2,400 2, square feet of parking and outdoor storage that would be that would appear within the riparian buffer, um, but that that quantity of impervious surface falls under the 20% coverage that is allowed within the buffer. That is what I've heard, and then. Um, I'll get to you in just a second, Alicia. Um, then we have heard that there would be disturbance to the buffer from the installation of the stormwater system outfall, which could be subject to a waiver. So, um, so Alicia, go ahead and um, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Um, there's two buffers for this area. There's the water setback buffer and the riparian buffer. So the actual impervious surfaces are within the water setback buffer not the riparian. So the riparian buffer is 25 feet from the top of the bank, the water setback is 50. Um, so we do encroach the water setback and that's the 20% that you mentioned um, that we're well under. And the riparian buffer is the area limited to, uh, excuse me, the disturbance too is limited to the outfalls. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, great, does anyone have any questions about do any board members have any questions about um, about what I just about this part of the application I just said I don't have any issue with the, the outfalls uh, inside the buffer uh, I think you know we can move forward on that time hope the board also okay. that way I agree thank you so um, in order to to grant that finding that um, it is acceptable to have those outfalls within the riparian buffer. We do need to grant, my understanding is that we need to grant a waiver. Um, so I'm just gonna ask Alicia, I'm put you on spot and ask you um, three questions about about the location of those outfalls to ensure that our waiver requirements are, are that a waiver is warranted. So, so the first thing we need to know um, is that, can these outfalls be located outside of the riparian buffer? No. Should do a okay. elaborate. Uh, Due to the, the existing conditions, 
um, the, the outfalls can't be outside of the repairing buffer due to the current um, conditions of the existing soils. Infiltration on this site is not feasible, so therefore we have to have um, a oversurface or closed drainage surface um, piping system to, to get the stormwater off of the site after a rain event. Um, so the, with the Winooski River bounding um, the entire northeast to southeast side of the site, um, that's, that's where we need to discharge. And unfortunately, with the elevations, it ends up being in that riparian buffer. Okay. Um, great, thank you. Does, once you've done this, does the proposal have new, compared to existing conditions, does the proposal have new or greater adverse impact on the natural functions of the surface water and land within the riparian area? No. Me... Um, this... Okay. We, we need to, sorry, I'll put that another way. We need to prove that the proposed, that this, this proposal does not create new or greater compared to existing conditions impact on the natural functions of surface water. So the, this and project right. does not create greater or new adverse impact. Um, the stormwater outfalls are creating an initial disturbance that are going to be stabilized um, with stone to dissipate energy of runoff and then also um, planting of wave vegetation to kind of reestablish that area. So both are allowing the, the refunctioning of that riparian buffer area, as well as now the stormwater is going through a treatment system, whereas um, currently there's no stormwater treatment on the area. So I think that's worth oh, mentioning. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I actually had a question um, about the current uh, stormwater situation. Do you know where the water is draining currently? Is it just going right into the river from that paved area? Yes, um, a significant portion of the site drains um, directly over the kind of over the bank. I, um, a lot of it ponds and then evaporates as time goes on. Um, and then there is some that I think flow probably to the north where there's the wetlands there. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, that's good. Chime in. Do, do chime in with questions. Um, so the last question is: Is this what is this the minimum development in the riparian area that's necessary? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to ask that question a different way. We need to show that the proposed development is the minimum necessary to accommodate. The proposed development in that area is the minimum necessary to accommodate reasonable use of the property. Is there any less than could, that could be done than what you're already doing? No, I don't believe so. We've uh, as we have planned it this way to minimize um, as best as we can. We need to have the stone outfall to, to dissipate the energy before the water, um, as the water exits the pipes. So we need to have that area remain stone. Um, we've tried to minimize the grading impacts as well as you know the pipe ditching um i'm planning on on having um kind of some construction notes making sure that those areas are very well marked so that equipment isn't moving beyond the limits that they need to be um in that especially in that area um and unfortunately the way the site is fairly flat we had to have two outfalls instead of one just um we couldn't get all the water to one one localized spot Okay. Um, are there other questions? Thank you very much. Um, do do DRB members have any other questions about 3005 riparian areas and the way that um, those the outfalls in particular will be um, in those in those areas? All right. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll move on. So. Moving through the staff report, still on page nine, um, section 3006 is wetlands and vernal pools. Um, staff finds compliance. We've heard testimony that those will not be encroached upon. Um, steep slopes, starting also on page nine, is 3007. Um, so, Alicia, could you describe the, you know, we have to look at slopes that are disturbed over 15%. Could you describe for us the extent of disturbance? disturbance of slopes that are on the site that are over 15 percent how much is being disturbed and, and why uh yes i can um so this is our the, the grading plan um much of the stream bank along the Winooski river is um 
significantly sloped, a lot, some of which is closer to 50%. Um, and so there, of course, we already mentioned the disturbance to those two areas. Um, we minimized as, as best as we could um, and kind of dealing with what we've got available. Um, the remainder of the disturbance to seat banks, um, you know, 15% area, uh, there's some just kind of natural grades that are, are sloped over in this area as um, I'm not sure how natural they originally were. You know, the road got built, the railroad got built. I think it probably kind of pushed out that um, slope from stabilizing those two pieces and that um, there's, there's very clearly a plateau that was created at one point to make this a developed site. And so I think that those are kind of the flaring off of um, the development at whatever point in history they were. So the, those are the, the disturbed areas. Um, and even again, along the railroad, there's, there's pieces and parts, but the um, disturbance to slopes is, uh, let's see, less than 5,000 square feet for everything above the 15% mark. So I think most of that is the, is the 15% mark, which is those kind of along the railroad and in this area here. And then there's the two localized um, outfalls that um, are being affected. Okay. Um, great. So I want to check in with Meredith on procedure here. Um, Meredith, I think, uh, is, is your question in the staff comment about whether we need to go through the steep slopes criteria based on the kind of de minimis almost amount of disturbance? Um, not really. It, it's, I, I sort of went through those a bit. And I mean, there is technically, you're supposed to go through the steep slopes criteria because it's development above 30%. Everything, in, in my opinion, everything that Alicia has provided meets all of those engineered requirements. We're not talking about, we don't need engineered structural plans because the building isn't on the steep slopes. Um, and you know, the only thing that's missing is a technically stamped and sealed plan from Alicia. That's the only oh. thing I saw is actually being required to meet the steep slopes requirements. Um, right, and so, oh, uh, sorry to cut. So Kate, Kate, you just saw that nice camp is down here, and this is um, one that Meredith had mentioned to me, and in you know in the staff report as well. And so I have these available. I did stamp them since, and I will um, submit them for the record, and uh, I can submit them um, tonight so that Meredith has them if we want to post it prior to uh, assuming there's a continuation prior to that meeting um, or certainly for the record. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I have a, I'll I have a turn question it over. Regarding the outfall. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, at least a few uh, calculated any expected flows and velocities that are going to be coming out of the pipes. During us, uh, yeah. um, I have done, um, as part of the stormwater system and the modeling, um, the Vermont State requires uh, treatment for this site because we're directly discharging to the Winooski. Um, we're not regulated by the, the 110 and 100 year storms. Um, so we are, we're establishing the treatment based on the one inch water quality volume um, standard storm. Um, and then I did check um, some some higher storm events to make sure that the velocities are still non-erosive and um, that's the stone that we're placing is, is intended to dissipate velocity even further. Um, is that, did I answer your question, Joe? You, you're kind of breaking it up a little bit, but it sounds like you, you double check to make sure that we don't have too high a velocity coming out of these pipes. Yes. Okay. All right, okay. I apologize for the, the breaking up. Okay. okay. Uh, that's a good question. Did we, every, it's in everyone's interest to make sure the outflow doesn't further erode the, the stream bank or cause uh, not sedimentation or no, acidity. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Roger. Oh, sorry. I, I thought I was muted. Nope. That's all right. That's all right. But do pipe up if you want to. I, I want to make sure we don't neglect you just because you don't have video. So. All right. Um, good. So, um, do do board members have any questions about steep slopes and um, and whether our standards for steep slopes are met? 
staff recommends, staff advises that they are met. Um, Kevin and then Claire. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, Meredith has done uh, due diligence on that issue, and I think we can just allude to to her findings in in our report in our uh, decision. Thank you, Claire. Did you want to add something as well? Oh, I thought I saw a wave, but it might have just been a page turn. All right. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, so continuing through. Um, on the staff report, page 10, we have section 3008 and 3009, erosion control and stormwater. And both of those are subject to state permits that stand in for the requirements of our zoning bylaw. So um, would the applicant be open to a condition that those permits would need, need to be submitted to be part of the record for our permit, for our local permit? Yeah. Okay. Um, so are there any board questions yes. about um, erosion control or stormwater? Okay. Uh, stormwater in general, including treatment. Uh, I was hoping that the engineer could uh, elaborate a little bit on the treatment method. It looks like it's a singular unit. I'm just kind of wondering uh, how, I guess I don't even know in depth how it works, but just does it require regular maintenance? Is it is it something that will still work if it's not maintained? Um, so, so you're you're all fully aware we're we're working on a, a couple different stormwater um, proprietary systems to see which is is better suited for this um, site. So the, there is one shown and it's called out as a context storm filter. Um, we're also looking into Aqua Shield storm filter. So um, any stormwater system needs to be properly maintained, and in order to stay in compliance with our state stormwater permit, we do have to do annual inspections. Um, as well as, you know, kind of you do the occasional uh, drive by and make sure things that are that are um, looking looking right. But there isn't there is a requirement through the state to have annual inspections um, and it has to be a certified person to do that type of inspection. And any type of maintenance item that's found needs to be immediately rectified um, uh, before you can kind of be in the good graces. Um, which, which really means, um, you know, there's, there's enforcement issues and such like that, but, um, Malone Properties does inspect their properties annually, um, and, and make sure that the sites are working. It's, it's a detriment to everyone when a system's not working properly, including the site. Um, okay. That was a very satisfactory answer. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Any other questions about erosion control or stormwater? Okay, we'll move on. Um, the, the next item is on page 11 of the staff report and it's section 3010, access and circulation. Um, what we uh, have heard and are seeing in the staff report is that this isn't, a, this isn't a public, this isn't a site for the public, so it's not coming and going all day long, but there is coming and going with the trucks that need to be serviced there. So we heard that there is two-way traffic throughout the site, um, that there is access uh, out onto Route 2 as part of the roundabout project, and including over the railroad. Um, I'm skimming through this and finding that um, this has been reviewed by the Department of Public Works and is, is believed to meet 3010. Um, with sufficient capacity for the roundabout, the road that the road that leads up to, um, maybe a little delay as large vehicles pull out onto Route Two, but traffic seems to be slowing down there anyway. Um, so staff recommendation is that to find that this access and circulation provision is met, and I would invite DRB comments or questions on that as well. Claire. I was curious on the number of trucks, uh, what would be the frequency of them coming and going and um, the number of employees. And, and I guess you've mentioned that it's not a place that the public would visit. So it'd basically be kind of the employees coming and then that, that truck traffic. So I was curious on yeah, how many trucks are coming and going during the day. Sure, there's proposed to be about 30 employees um, at this facility. 
Um, so you could assume they would arrive in the in the morning and leave in the evening. Um, and then additionally, of course, those same employees, some of them are office um, and some of them are on-site or, or um, off-site, I suppose, employees. So they would take a vehicle with them and employee equipment um, and, and go to a, a site. Um, typically, they go all day until they're ready to return in the evening. Um, they kind of do all of their, their stops and they go to the treatment facility plant to do any type of offloading um, in between and then continue on. And then they come back to, you know, at, the, at the close of their day, um, provided there's no kind of uh, mechanical issues with the, the equipment. Um, so it's, it's not expected to have um, in and out every, after every um, hour or any, there's no, there's no time because it really depends on the number of um, customers that are, that are being serviced at that time. Um, but there is, there's kind of the, you know, trip generation um, manuals that we can refer to for different type of uses. And I, um, I feel like those are just guidelines. They're, they're a little uh, up to interpretation sometimes, but this um, particular use just kind of falls into the light industrial use where there's expected to be um, 157 trips per day only 21 and 22 in the a.m. peak hour and the p.m. peak hour, respectively. Um, so that really is is very comparable to the number of employees there. Um, also worth mentioning the the hours that of operation are a little bit um, a little bit off offset from typical peak hours. Um, they they are more of a six in the morning to six in the evening um, company than than an eight to four thirty. So the, the peak hour of commuting employees are, are less likely to coincide with other peak um, users. Thank you. Claire. I said a follow-up question. I think uh because that, that access is coming on to route two. Um, have you sought the section 111 permit um, for the access on a state highway? Um, so this this particular project is um, a, a little different because it already has um, the access point is already considered to be an access for this um, mission. Yeah. So this location right here, this crossing, and this is the state um, state road uh, or you know, route two. Um, so this access point doesn't. It's already back here where we're connecting to. I, I accidentally drew the dark lines into the crossing, but our, our work will start beyond the railroad right of way. Um, so we, we don't need to have that working in the, um, working in the right of way permit. And also is this section um, of road, for, for some reason I'm thinking the actual section of road is under the, um, the town, the city's authority, but um, either way. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so we're seeing um, a, 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 just as we ask questions about access and circulation, you the image you've just showed us is that this is a road that's going to be a fourth spoke off of the roundabout. Right, and it is an Whereas existing fourth spoke. So if you and you may not even spoke. Yes, and you might not even think of it because by the time you see the building, you're down here, and so you're thinking you're you're not even wondering where they come in. But this, the the access point right now is currently here. Um, the the railroad already has their their crossing, um, and they have signals and and such there. Um, that was part of this roundabout project in two thousand nine. Okay. Well, that's in accurate. That's pretty accurate, uh, Claire. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I guess. I see. Great. Okay. Yeah, and uh, um, I just like to add that uh, when I was working, sorry, when I was working in construction, we actually used this lot as our loading area for heavy construction vehicles and moving materials in and out. It's appropriate for for large vehicles and things. There was no issues there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, any other questions about access and circulation? 
All right. So next, I'd like to take a peek at the um, parking and loading standards, which begin on page 14 of our staff report. Um, staff finding is that the proposed parking areas meet the requirements of this section in terms of the size of the parking spaces. The number of parking spaces is not too many and not too few. There is not a requirement for um, electric vehicle charging station because only 30 of the 43 or 45 spots are for employee use. The others are for vehicle. Um, so EV charging is not required. Um, are there are there questions about parking and loading or anything else that um, the applicant would like to add? Okay. All right. So. Um, I'm going to pause there. Um, it's 9.59 and we've reached what I think could be a natural stopping point. We've gotten to the, um, we've, we've gotten through the general use standards and have stopped at the, um, or the general standards rather, and are, are stopped, stopped at the special use standards. So I'm going to ask what the pleasure of the board is and the applicant in terms of how we proceed. Would you like to take another fixed amount of time and get through as much as we can? Or given that we, I, I think that we need to continue this hearing to do it well. And um, I, so my first question is, um, is the applicant willing to have this hearing continued to the, our next DRB meeting? Yes. I would wonder if we could potentially um, discuss the items that are relative to Mr. Rooney and, and Ms. Hoffmeyer's presence here so that they don't need to come back, if that would be sure. appropriate, or one, one, of the, one of the two, um, leave, leave us here, and if anybody has any questions about site, but maybe maybe he can join us the next one if there's, if there's questions about the soil, but I'd like to not have to um, force them to come back. Okay. I'm more, I'm more right. um, is it, is it, thank you. Is that agreeable to DRB members? Yes. Yes. The specifically testimony from the two um, attendees um, specific to this project, um, and then we will continue the uh, the meeting to the next DRB meeting. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Alicia, I would take your advice on, uh, we, we can hear from both John Rooney and Sarah Hoffmeyer, and I would um, take your advice on which which we should hear from first, which oh, topic we should tackle first. Sure. Oh, Kevin? Just, just, just sorry, real quickly, sorry, Alicia, Kevin. We, I'm not sure that these uh, two attendees were, were sworn in. Maybe they were, and I just missed that. They were. They were okay. sworn in. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, so I don't know if there's a natural flow. Um, Mr. Green is our, our architect, so if there's any questions about the design of the building, and then um, uh, Sarah is our um, landscape architect, um, uh, certified horticulturalist, um, and so she helped us with our landscaping design. So I don't know if there's a preference on which. I don't think it matters. Um, just to kind of get us through those ones. All right, we'll we'll go alphabetical by last name. Um, and so, Sarah, why don't you? Um, uh, you worked on the landscaping, and so for everybody's reference, landscaping is covered by section thirty two o two, and we have information about that on page nineteen of our staff report. Okay. Um, so, Sarah, do you want to take a couple minutes to tell us very briefly about the landscape design and? Um, then we'll take a peek at the staff report. Sure. Um, it is a bit of a challenging site because there are a lot of limitations with the railroad, the wetland, um, the river, of course, um, and then where the stormwater treatment areas are. So, um, and then of course, uh, the fact that the um, site needed to be capped for soil remediation. So, um, uh, as far as it was being a brownfield site. Um, and so that limited kind of where to put some of the plants and the trees. But um, looking at the western side of the property along the railroad, um, I think the 
best thing to do and what is in this plan is to um, create just small berms so that um, it's helping with the screening, it's helping with the health of the plants. I think that's the, the biggest thing is how to get long-term success out of these plants. So to give it more soil volume, so to add a little bit more soil um, to allow the tree roots to really take and then to become shade trees. So uh, the species that are chosen um, are pretty rugged. They can really take um, a beating. So uh, Freeman maple, it's salt tolerant. It's a combination, it's a, a combination of silver maple and red maple. So it's fast growing, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's just a really rugged species. Honey locust, again, another rugged species. These are all pretty quick growing species because I think establishment is really important so that they can get to be that big size and do their job of intercepting stormwater, intercepting rainwater, um, and also casting shade. So with all the impervious surface, lessening the amount of heat that's coming off of that site. Um, I, I'll ramble if, uh, <laughs> if you want me to, but I'll, I'll take whatever questions, whatever direction you yeah. want to go in. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good overview. It gives us the context of the site that you're working in, which informs what, um, why you put different things in different places. So um, that's good. Um, we, the staff recommendation uh, conclusion is that this, that this um, complies with all the minimum planting areas and the number of species um, and provide sufficient shade trees um, along the travel aisle and in the parking area. And then there's the buffer as well. So um, maybe I would just turn it over to my um, fellow DRB members as to whether there are any questions about the landscaping plan. About on the far left of the diagram, so towards the end part of the building, Are you are you talking about to the um we'll say it left of the addition? Correct. Yeah. Far left, yeah. What would there be any proposed trees on that end? So there's um oh yeah. hi Alicia. There there's a um if you're looking to the further north, there's actually a natural area that is adjacent to the storage area. And in any landscape, one of the most important things is to preserve and protect the existing mature trees because it takes a long time for them to get like that. And that's a big investment. So if you can see in between where the wetland boundary is and then the fence of the um, right next to the storage area, that there's a section of natural, um, it's like a, a natural woodland area. Yeah. That, there we go, that'll be protected. So no additional trees are needed there. Um, it's not expected to be disturbed. Thank you. And also, um, Jean, just to mention, so a lot of this area in here is um, sidewalk. So it's it's to help people, um, give enough space so that the accessible vehicles and also these employee vehicles can access that front entrance. And so we don't have any plantings directly on this. Um, this area here, I, I, it is kind of a grassy area and we haven't designated plants there. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be plants ending up there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do DRB members have any other questions about um, about the landscaping and screening? So uh, legislative picked the applicant for a very well prepared plan. I think it uh, saved us a lot of time here from our review and uh, um, really makes the process go smoother. So uh, thank you very much. This is this is great. Thanks, Rob. Okay, if we hey, take hey. a follow up questions, we're... oh, sorry, does someone want to jump in there? If we think of follow-up questions, we're allowed we're allowed to ask them. But it, that, it seems like that is a good overview of the landscaping on the project. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so what we'll do next is 
turn to John Rooney and hear a little bit about the architecture. And I'm going to cross-reference that again with our staff report. So this, what, what we need to determine is whether the design has compatibility with the, um, with the neighborhood in which this project is located. So this is on page 23 of our staff report. Um, and it's section 3207 of the zoning bylaw. I'm just gonna, we, we don't do this as often because we so often get projects in um, the design review district, but I'll just read it. Section 3207 requires architectural standards for all projects requiring major site plan approval with the intent to ensure that proposed development will be compatible with and enhance the visual appearance of the street and neighborhood and exhibit consistent design integrity in all building components including roof forms, windows and entrances, building materials, facade details, et cetera. Um, we're in the Eastern Corridor neighborhood um, and the, there are a series of architectural standards there at the bottom of page 23 um, that, I, that I'm not going to read. But um, maybe we could hear from John just with a, with a very brief, like less, probably less than five minute overview of the, of the design and how it meets those standards. Thank you for bearing with us, John. I can do it in a lot less than five minutes. All uh, right. Do we, do we have any of the, the pictures up or everybody's familiar with the, with the renderings? Thank you, Alicia. Thanks, Alicia. Um, well, as you, as you know, this is an industrial building and industrial buildings by their nature tend to be very blocky because um, they're, they're large, they usually have flat roofs and, and, and this building is, is no exception. Um, but what we tried to do is, is through texture and color and, and scale, change, the, change the, the look of the building and give it, and give it, give it interest. Plus, um, you know, in, indentations and obviously the, the existing building is just a rectangular box or we, we, we're, we are, are stuck with that, but the a new addition, we tried to break up the facade to meet the requirements and, and to give the building um, visual interest. The, the yellow orange part that you see at the back is where the offices are located. So we use that change in, in color and height to differentiate the office space from the warehouse workspace. Um, and then the, 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 the materials, uh, as you probably read, are in, indicated on the, around the bottom of the, the, um, the, work, the workshops, we used uh, uh, block in, in two colors to give a striation, which um, again is, is applying texture to complement the, the the metal siding, which would be very, is you know, is, is very smooth. So there's a nice contrast in texture. Plus, the concrete block is is a, is a more durable material down near the ground, where you have you, you have salt and you have um, potential for damage from from vehicles and that sort of thing. Now the, and the the office portion. Again, is 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 metal because metal is uh, you know a very typical exterior material for this kind of building. So we thought it was very appropriate. And on the on the um, the warehouse or the industri industrial shop side, we used the vertical siding and and by using a couple of a couple of different shades again it just adds texture and color and breaks down the scale of the building and and, and again with this type of building it just breaks it down from a monolithic kind of structure and to give it uh, give it appeal i cut there's a cutout in the corner where i was put a a canopy to protect the the entry to the to the shop and in hindsight, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I think I would, I would uh, do the fascia of that canopy 
in the yellow to, to draw in the color of the office, minor detail. I'm always tweaking with things like that. And uh, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions? So the structure is a metal structure. Does it have a stone, stone veneer in the bottom? Is that Con concrete block? Concrete. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm suggesting uh, like a split face concrete block. We may. We have two bands, uh, a darker and a lighter, and I'm thinking the darker one may we do with a split face, and then the lighter ones maybe smooth face again to to play up the different textures. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? A metal sheathing. Uh, what kind of metal is it? And uh, how do you expect it to age? Um, well, it'll be, it'll be a, a pre-finished, you know, factory finish that would, uh, it would age. So coated or painted? Yeah, but it'd be a, it'd be a factory. They're factory finishes. I'm not sure exactly what, whether it's a Kynar or, um, you know, we haven't got to the, there are a number of different manufacturers out there and we haven't specified exactly which manufacturer that at this, at this point in time. Okay, I guess I would just be concerned about certain metal sheathings can rust or where they're riveted, they can rust and that definitely affects the, uh, the look of the building over time. All right, well, they're, they're yeah, the, but the, these, the panels they're making nowadays are much improved over the past, but, and the vertical ones would, would, would be, have hidden fasteners, so you wouldn't, they wouldn't be exposed. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from board members about the building? I, I will ask, um, I, I, I appreciate hearing about um, the, the design characteristics, the more artist, the artistic pieces of it, but I'm gonna ask a boring question, which is, um, could you, I, I don't see any mechanical equipment, any vents or compressors or anything um, in the diagrams that, in, in the um, building diagrams that we're looking at now. Can you tell me where those will be and where they'll be visible from? At this moment, I, I cannot. We, um, we would need a mechanical engineer to provide us with, but that is a very good point. Um, it may be necessary to, to screen them unless we can put them back, locate them back farther on the roof where, there'd be, where they wouldn't be um, visible from the, from the street. Okay. All right, let's, just for thinking about that and for, for DRB members' um, consideration, the standard we've got to meet there is mechanical equipment, electrical meter, and service components, and similar utility devices, whether at ground level or mounted on the building, shall be screened from view at the front property line with materials that are compatible with the building's predominant exterior materials. That's what we're going for. Um, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, this is directed to Mr. Rooney. Uh, when you get into the HVAC systems and the compressors and so forth, uh, it would also be useful to, you're not in any kind of residential area there, but in the river corridor, sound travels quite a, quite a distance. And compressors are one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that often uh, become the source of uh, of noise pollution in a situation like that. So I'd like to ask you if you would keep that as uh, uh, part of your uh, review when you get into designing that. The um, no, I, I don't quote me on this, but the the office space, which was probably be air conditioned and and obviously heated, and it's it's only a, a small uh, percentage of, of the square footage, and probably very. We'll probably be using, I think, we'll be using rooftop units, which means that 
that you know they wouldn't the sound wouldn't be a problem. The warehouse shop areas. Um, my feeling is at this point in time they will probably just be heated internally, so they won't have compressors on the exterior. But I don't know. I don't know this moment in time what our our heat source will be, our, our fuel source for for heating and cooling. Okay. So even though it's a large large building, a, a, gr a good percentage of it would have very little in, in terms of uh, mechanical equipment on the roof. Mm -hmm. There'd be exhausts for uh, dealing with the, with the trucks and equipment. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just, oh yeah, Alicia, go ahead. Um, I think there was also discussion about um, putting it behind the raised roof portion of the building. So a lot of the roof is 22 feet and then that office block is 26 feet tall. So um, there was a, where there was consideration about putting it kind of behind that already elevated um, four foot buffer of a roof. Um, uh, at least it would buffer from, from certain sides. Um, that's, that's the initial thought. Oh, right. I, yeah, I forgot about that. Right. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I hear Patrick speak, trying to speak, but I can't hear you very well. So if you'd like to chime in, um, would you please try again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, um, thank you. The, the units will be behind the lower roof addition. The, the addition is going to be five feet higher. So the units will be behind that. They will be hidden. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, while we have while we have John Rudy here, I want to ask one more question that is actually in a different section of the um, bylaw, but we're not tonight, but on another night, we're going to talk more about um, section 3206, solar access and shading. And one piece of that requires that the roof surface, roof surface of new buildings be flat, which it is, and be physically and structurally capable of supporting a certain number of solar collectors. Um, will this roof be physically and structurally capable of supporting some solar collectors? Uh, yes. I'm seeing an that would be up to the structural engineers. It, it will be, John. Will it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll make note of that. Roof will hold solar. Um, thank you. That was one item where we had the roof of the addition. The roof of the addition. Good clarification. Oh, they say for back. That's good. <laughs> All right. Um, great. So that brings us through landscaping and um, so the design and compatibility considerations. Are there any other questions for John or Sarah? All right. So if it's amenable to all, I would like to propose that um, this application be continued to our next hearing. Is that still acceptable to the applicant? Yes. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a motion from Kevin to, to continue this to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which is on July 6th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Is there a second? A second. I'll second. Okay, we've got a motion by Kevin, a second by Jean. And now I will take the roll. Um, all those in, uh, Joe. Yes. Rob. Yes. Michael. Yes. Jean. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Roger. Yes. And I'm Kate and I'm voting yes as well. And Claire, I've, I've left you off that because you won't be continuing on this. Sorry. Don't need to be left out. Great. Um, so the um, the application for 260 River Street will be taken up again on July 6th. Um, we look forward to talking with you more, and thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. 
All right, remaining business of this board for the evening is um, approval, getting back to my agenda, um, reviewing and approving the meeting minutes of February 18th, 2020 and Jan June 1st, 2020. Um, I'm moving to those in the big staff packet to see who can vote on each of these. All right, so a bit eligible to vote on the February 18th minutes are myself, Rob, Claire, Michael, Roger, and that's all. So um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 18th, 2020? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of February 18th, 2020. Thank you. Motion by Rob. Second? I'll second that. Second by Claire. I will do the roll of those eligible to vote um, to approve the minutes from February. Uh, Roger? Yes. Thank you. Rob? Yes. Claire? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I'm Kate and I vote yes. Thank you, we've approved the minutes of February 18th. Um, next, we will entertain a motion to, we um, need to approve the minutes of June 1st, 2020. Eligible to vote are myself, Kevin, Rob, um, Michael, Jean, and Joe. So do I have a motion to approve the uh, minutes as printed, or uh, approve the minutes as printed? for June 1st, 2020. So moved. Motion, to motion by Joe, is that right? No, that was a minute. Second? No. So moved by Rob. Motion by Rob, second by? Jean. Second by Jean. Is there any discussion? Okay, we'll do the roll to vote. Um, Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Jean? Yes. Joe? Yes. And I'm Kate, I'm voting yes. Um, very good, thank you very much. We've approved our minutes. Um, caught up with our backlog. Um, other business, our next meeting date is July 6th at seven o'clock. I believe it will be, we will be Zooming together again. Um, any other business or announcements? I'll make a motion to adjourn the. Um... Oh, and I couldn't unmute fast oh. enough. Just a quick note. Meredith. Um, and this is this is for you. It's also for the public, and you'll get something in writing. All the DRB members. A quick early notice that we are only going to have one hearing in August. The second hearing, the August seventeenth hearing, is canceled. Um, but the so the August third uh, will be the only potential DRB hearing in the month of August. Thank you, Meredith, for letting us know well in advance. Good for everyone to know. Okay. Any other announcements? I was okay, hearing none, I'll entertain. Yeah, I was making the motion to adjourn our meeting this evening. Motion by Kevin? I'll second. This is Joe. Second from Joe. Um, I'm not going to do this by roll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Okay. It is unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much.